Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Poultry Science Association's uh, quarterly webinar. Thank you for joining us as uh, PSA continues to uh, promote information and research related to the poultry industry. I'm Brian Fairchild. I'm currently serving as the PSA president for the 2023-24 term, uh, the president of the board of directors. But before I introduce our speaker, let's go over a few useful tips uh, for Zoom webinars. It's a little bit different than doing a Zoom meeting. The webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on the PSA website within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. If you have a question, just type it into the Q&A tab by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Do not use the raised hand uh, icon. Um, if you if you hit that, um, we're, we're not really gonna be monitoring that and won't be able to give you permission to speak or anything during this webinar. When you ask a question in the Q&A tab, uh, myself, uh, Rebecca, some of the others with PSA will, will uh, be monitoring this and we will read that question uh, off at the end of the seminar to Dr. Laverne and have her um, answer those questions for you. All the attendees uh, will be able to like or comment uh, on the other's attendees' questions. The more likes that question gets, the higher priority it'll be in our system. Uh, so we'll be able to flag those questions first and uh, answer those, make sure they get asked before our time's up. So. As you see those questions pop up, uh, please like it. And if you've got the same question, uh, like it as well, because I'll just make sure that we get that topic covered. If we run out of time to answer all the questions at the end of this webinar, we will go in order of the priority each question has been uh, assigned. The This chat option is not available during the webinar. It has been disabled but please feel free to put your questions into that Q&A icon uh, at the bottom of the screen. The subtitles are gonna be enabled for this webinar, but you can turn them off on your screen if you don't wanna, if you find them distracting by clicking the hide captions icon at the bottom of your screen. So now let's move on to introducing our speaker. We are, going to, uh, we are joined today uh, by Dr. Theresa Laverne, Dr. Laverne has been involved in agriculture throughout her life. She was born in South Florida, where her family owned a beef processing and meat packing plant. During her childhood, she moved to Central Florida and grew up on a thoroughbred broodmare farm. In addition, uh, Theresa was a 4-H member for 10 years and was involved in livestock projects and judging teams. She has a Bachelor of Science uh, degree in animal and Dairy Sciences from Auburn University, a Master's of Science degree in Monogastric Nutrition from Mississippi State University, and a PhD in Monogastric Nutrition from Louisiana State University. She began her career with Lando Lakes uh, Feed as a Swine Technical Service Manager for two years. She then spent almost 17 years as a Professor and State Poultry Extension Specialist with the LSU Ag Center. In 2016, Theresa returned to industry as a monogastric technical services manager with Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production, where she supported their probiotic and prebiotic products for the poultry industry. In 2022, she joined Natural Biologics as a senior technical service manager and continues to work with them currently. As so we are very excited to uh, have Dr. Theresa Laverne here as our speaker this week. Uh, so without wasting any more time, please join me in welcoming her. And Dr. Laverne, you have got the floor. Dr. Fairchild, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you to PSA for having these webinars. I'm excited to be able to talk with everybody today. Okay, so you've seen my title. It's all about the microbiome and what can affect it. The microbiome is actually relatively a very new term um, in the whole scheme of things. 
or a new idea, whichever way you want to look at it. It was actually first recognized in the 1990s, late 1990s, and at that time was described as a newly discovered organ. We do know there are many more microbial cells than there are actually human or animal cells within a body. But we also know they weigh almost nothing when you look at the total weight of an animal or a person. I've seen reports of the microbiome weighing anywhere from 200 grams to three pounds total. Of course, that's going to vary based on the size of the animal, the size of the GI tract, how many bugs are in there. But overall, when you think about it, um, there's a lot of little things there, but they don't have any weight. So with all of this uh, and lots to consider, we do know that the microbiome does have a huge impact on health. And not just when we're talking about poultry or animals, but also human health. Um, we That's a growing area of science as well. Let's look at the microbiome in, human, in humans. Another point that we can remember or think about is that one reason this is still a relatively new area of study is because these microbes in our microbiome don't culture very easily. It was not until the non-culturable procedures like DNA testing really came out about and their availability much more wide that we could actually identify what's in the microbiome, um, identify it, enumerate it, and learn, really start learning about it. So throughout um, our little bit of time here together today, we obviously have to start with definitions. So we all are thinking in the same direction when we talk about the microbiome. I'll talk about some characteristics and functions of the microbiome. Um, many different factors can affect it and we'll discuss some of those. I have modulators on this list and in my thinking that's feed additives, uh, different components we're using or adding to feed to work towards shifting the microbiome to be good or favorable mature, well-developed microbiome. And then I'll go through some data that we've been very fortunate to um, be part of and collect here at Natural Biologics um, as we're looking at expanding just overall research and information on the microbiome and building databases to support um, good and bad, learn good and bad bacteria and biomarkers, and just overall gain a lot of knowledge on the microbiome and what it can do for poultry. So first, if you do a search for the definition of microbiome, just like anything else you do a search for, for a definition, of course, you're going to get a long list. Uh, some of the things you can come up with when you search for the definition of microbiome our community of microbes, totality of microbes, all of the microorganisms within an environment. You'll find that it's a living dynamic environment. You might see that it's a collection of all the microbes, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, as well as their genes. So it's a compilation of a lot of things. It's important to note that the abundance of the different species within the microbiome fluctuate constantly. Um, depending on the animal we're talking about, the age, whatever, um, these fluctuations can occur daily, weekly, monthly, um, all the time. It's not a constant situation. It's an always changing environment, always changing um, situation and what it contains as far as um, as we identify what's in there and the abundance of those, it, it continues to change constantly. And with change, I guess, kind of goes along variability. Um, those are two of the big characteristics of a microbiome. It changes and it's very variable. We cannot just look at the microbiome of one set of broilers, one flock of broilers, and expect that to be the microbiome of all broilers. Um, even if we look at a specific age, the microbiome is very variable. Yes, we can gather data and build our databases and kind of get an idea of what we should see. And there are a lot of those characteristics defined already of what we could expect in the microbiome of a young bird versus a mature bird. But there's a lot of variability because there's so many factors that affect it. So we can get a good idea, but it's not going to be perfect and not going to fit every situation. 
and variability, or I shouldn't say variability, but the microbiome, we know changes with age. So the chick's microbiome is going to be different than a growing bird or a mature bird. And then it's going to be different than different, different than other birds, the turkey. We know the turkey's microbiome is different. The broilers, um, while we're building our database of everything, we know a lot less about the turkey microbiome than we do about the chicken. And then if we think of other species, ducks, geese, quail, wild birds, of course, all of those are going to have a di different microbi microbiome as well. But in all cases, we just remember this is a vast collection of microbes. It includes everything from bacteria to fungi to viruses, their genes, and it includes the good bacteria. And unfortunately, there's bad or harmful bacteria as well. Um, more terms. We see terms like microbiome and microbiota, and you might hear and see them used interchangeably, but they're actually different. The microbiome includes the environment. It is the environment in which the microbes live. So it's the environment, the bugs, their genes, everything there. But when we say microbiota, the definition of that is just the bugs, the bugs that are living in that environment of the microbiome. So a little more specific on poultry and my line of thinking here as we talk today. Um, when I say microbiome, I'm meaning the totality of the microorganisms and their genome, obviously within that environment of the gut. And then when we talk about microbiota, it is the community, the entire community, the commensal bacteria, the symbiotic bacteria, the pathogenic bacteria. And another little important tidbit, there are two times more microbe cells, microbiota cells in the chicken than the chicken has itself. So it's twice as many cells as its host. <clears throat> Characteristics of the microbiome itself. Um, there are a lot of members within that microbiome. I keep saying that, that's a general theme. And as I said, um, a lot of them are not culturable. Um, it's probably about 70% of what's in that microbiome can actually not be cultured on just a regular plate in the laboratory. Um, it was not until we have all that had all those advances in molecular biology and high throughput sequencing technology that are culture independent, not until we have those technologies that we could really get in and identify and enumerate what is in the microbiome. So why it's a relatively new concept still. Um, it's complex. The microbiome is very complex. There's a lot to it, um, a lot of changes, variability again. Um, we just, and we know it has very complex interactions with its host and those interactions can be good and bad. Um, we know there's pathogenic organisms that can occur and take over in the microbiome. But at the same time, there's a lot of beneficial bacteria that um, do good, have a good relationship and a benefit, symbiotic relationship, benefit both the host and themselves. And we know that all of that can play a role in the health of poultry. Uh, next, I have a performance and health listed there. They generally go hand in hand, of course. You know, we have to have healthy animals to have good performing animals and to meet our um, growth performance targets. So we have to keep all that together and remember that the microbiome can definitely affect that as well. So we also have to mention at this point, gut health. Um, that's a huge part of what we do today in working towards having healthy animals with good gut health so they can be the most productive animals. And we know that the microbiome affects the gut health because it is involved in some of the interactions um, such as um, structural integrity of the gut, um, balancing the microbiome, um, swaying it more towards a good or um, ben having beneficial bacteria versus bad. And it also can affect the um, immune system or the immune status of the host. When we have a good, healthy and functional gut microbiome, um, 
we can expect more optimum growth performance and meeting our performance targets of our flocks. Um, and an example, you know, if we have pathogens, we're going to have not as good performance. Obviously, um, they tend to reduce our rate of gain, feed conversion. Um, whereas if we can shift to a more beneficial or uh, favorable microbiome, we can improve those situations, improve our growth rate, optimize performance. Um, and then kind of going on hand in hand with those good versus bad, we get the, the states of eubiosis or dysbiosis um, based on the um, makeup of the microbiota within the microbiome. Functions. Um, there's many functions of the microbiome. I just have three listed here, um, like most of my lists that you might see today. Uh, they're not complete. There's always more, but kind of highlighting some of the functions of the microbiome pathogen exclusion. And this is one that we want um, to happen in a favorable way, right? When we do ex think about pathogen exclusion, it's two species trying to compete to live, but they cannot do this successfully together. So one outcompetes the other. And in this case, of course, we want those good bacteria to be the one to outcompete and um, reduce the pathogen, pathogenic bacteria that can be there. So we can do this, for example, by using probiotics in the feed or as a water treatment, right? We're putting those good bacteria there into the gut. Um, they can compete with bad bacteria for food. And obviously, if there's more, they should take more of that food source as well as they can um, produce bacteriosins to help inhibit those um, bad bacteria from growing and just kind of overall help prevent the bad bacteria from colonizing in the gut. Another function of the microbiome is nutrient production. Um, the commensal bacteria that are there can help contribute nutrients to the host such as short chain fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins. Um, in addition, with the enzymes they might produce, they can help hydrolyze polysaccharides into the primary sugars as an energy source, um, ferment those sugars, um, producing more short chain fatty acids, and just provide an excellent benefit um, for the host as well. And then we know that the microbiome plays a role in the immune system of the host. Um, it can modulate, regulate, and help activate the innate and the acquired immune response. Um, for the innate immune response, the microbiota can play a role in establishing that mucus layer in the intestine, which of course is a barrier in the first line of defense against infection within the host. Um, for acquired immune response, the commensal bacteria can play a role in stimulating the immune cells and helping the uh, increase the expression of cytokines, all benefiting the health and improving the health of the host. And like I said, these aren't complete lists. So just a couple other things, uh, functions of the microbiome might be enzyme production, regulating the endocrine system, hormone signaling, um, many, many functions of the microbiome. We're learning, and there's probably plenty we have not learned about yet. So the poultry biome, variable, changes constantly, um, is also affected by many, many things. And here's just a short list of those. It can be affected by the age of the poultry or whatever animal we're talking about, the diet we feed it, uh, medication. Um, and most of the times in poultry, we're talking about antibiotics versus non-antibiotics, the environment that the poultry live in, its health status, the feed additives we choose, where in the digestive tract we're looking at the microbiome. It, it does vary from location to location. Um, the cecum is definitely different than the rest of the digestive tract because feed tends to stay there the longest. So um, bugs tend to eat longer there. There's more that can happen in the cecum as compared to other parts of the digestive tract. And of course, management, what we do every day with a flock is gonna affect the microbiome. So now I'm gonna go into a few of these in a little more detail. One of those um, factors affecting the microbiome is age. Um, there are major and dramatic changes in the microbiota biota that occur with age. 
um, typically younger chicks um, compared to growers or mature birds. Um, the younger ones have less diversity or less number of genera present, but we see successional changes in the bacteria as that bird ages. We see differences in what's present there as far as microbiota, as well as the abundance. So the composition changes as the bird ages. Uh, variability, again, keeps coming up. That's a common theme. We see a lot of changes and a lot of variability from chicken to chicken, I guess flock to flock, even within the same farm, same house on the same farm, we can see a lot of change and variability from flock to flock. Um, just some kind of general concepts there as far as genera. The younger bird in the first few days tends to be higher in proteobacteria which includes E. coli, <laughs> and that will decrease in general as the bird ages. Um, in the past, I've been involved in quite a bit of analysis where we were looking at some of the pathogenic organisms present in hatched chicks versus seven-day-old chicks and older chicks. And definitely, um, we see most of the time, not all the time, most of the time that hatched chick is pretty high in E. coli. So I definitely agree with this term. Um, as the birds get older, the firmicutes tend to increase. And unfortunately, this is where clostridia might come in. And that's why we could see some of those clostridia related issues as the bird ages a little bit. So overall, microbiota change, mature as the, age, as the bird ages. Um, those changes are not always constant from flock to flock or bird to bird. Within a flock, we see a lot of variation. Diet, diet is off, obviously a huge consideration when we're looking at what can affect the microbiota. Um, very important to remember, dietary nutrients are not only nutrients for the birds, they are nutrients for the microbiota too. So there's a list of things that can affect the microbiota based on what we feed or the diet we feed. Those nutrients within the diet can modulate growth um, and the establishment of the microbiota. They can be affected by the grain source we feed, the level of non-starch polysaccharides, the fat source, whether it's animal or vegetable fat, source of protein in the diet. We just find that and know that there are certain groups of bacteria that favor certain types of diets or favor certain feedstuffs. And depending on what that poultry, that flock is being fed, obviously we can change the microbiome or it will be different than others based on the different types of feedstuffs we use. Antibiotics, and of course today, um, it's generally been no antibiotics, although some of that might be changing. And, and this is really still a new area for us as well um, as poultry nutrition nutritionists, poultry scientists, um, because I like to say every day now is kind of new territory um, for those companies that have made the commitment, gone away from using antibiotics. You know, we've never been in all of production and all of time this far away from the use of antibiotics. So we're still learning a lot about changes, however many years down the road we are from antibiotics. So it's all kind of new territory. And of course, the microbiome really plays a huge role in how we raise those animals or what we try to do to that microbiome to keep that bird healthy and productive without the use of antibiotics. But just some uh, characteristics there of using antibiotics or not. Um, when we do feed antibiotics, we will see a reduction in the microbiota stability. Generally, that means we see a reduction in lactobacillus because antibiotics generally don't discriminate. Discriminate; They can kill everything. Um, they're not picking out good and bad. They might just kill all bacteria. So that's why after you have to do or if you have to do an antibiotic treatment in the flock, you follow that up with a lactobacillus treatment to get that lactobacillus good bacteria back in the gut and let it colonize because it could have been killed. Another um, thing we tend to see with the use of antibiotics is less of those uh, microbial families that are associated with starch cellulose or hemicellulose degradation. So 
just some characteristics we see when we use antibiotics. But we can overcome them, um, like I said, maybe with the lactobacillus treatment following in antibiotic use, if that was the situation that we had. Okay, environment. Environment is a huge factor that can affect the microbiome. We usually, or maybe I, I usually, think about the pests. When we talk about bugs, the rodents, um, they bring all kinds of pathogens, viruses, bad things onto the farm. Um, I don't know that we can ever eliminate bugs and rodents. We try really hard to keep them under control, um, but we just kind of have to remember they're going to be there. Um, we'll do what we can to control them, but they definitely bring some bad things on the farm. So again, um, and contribute not generally positively, more negatively, they contribute to that microbiome that um, ultimately is in the bird. Litter, uh, when we think of litter, that's generally the first source of a probiotic that uh, day old chicks are exposed to. So keeping that in mind, we want that litter set up to be good and not provide pathogens um, to colonize that gut because that chick is already, like I said, kind of high in E. coli or very likely that it it's high in E. coli. So we want to make sure we do reuse litter we're going to probably do that forever, a long time. We reuse litter. Um, so we have to make sure that litter has been at least treated with a litter amendment or gone through a management practice such as pasteurizing the litter, um, which is in-house in composting or wind rowing to reduce the pathogen load in the litter. That way it's reduced the pathogens um, load that that chick is exposed to. Um, of course, sanitation is going to play a huge role um, in having good or bad bacteria around. I guess, again, we're thinking if we're for sanitation, we have more bad bacteria. And then people, people are the number one means of moving diseases around to livestock and poultry. So definitely we can carry pathogens um, that can get into that microbiome. I guess we could carry good ones too. Maybe we need to spray ourselves with some bacillus or lactobacillus before we walk in the houses. But again, that's, Another reason why we have strict biosecurity protocols is to um, prevent people from bringing in things that would cause a negative uh, microbiome or contribute to the negative microbiome. Diet and feed additives. This will kind of be the major focus of the rest of the presentation. Um, we have a whole list of what I call modulators, um, things we can feed or put through water treatments for poultry to work to shift the microbiome to be positive, to reduce the pathogenic microorganisms. Um, and this is in, by no means a complete list. It is a list that continues to grow um, quite often. But of course, you have all the biotics there at the beginning from prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics, antibiotics, phytobiotics. Um, and then I've already mentioned some feedstuffs, uh, how that can affect, and then a couple, uh, well, bacteriophages is a newer technology, and then of course, enzymes. All of those can be used to either directly or indirectly uh, affect the microbiome in its makeup. So a little more specific about these feed, some of the feed additives, prebiotics. Of course, um, prebiotics have been around for quite a while now, and are very widely used um, throughout poultry diets. And we do, they are used to feed the good bacteria, like the lactobacillus, the bifidobacterium. They can, these prebiotics are not digestible to the monogastric. They stay in the gut and feed those good bacteria. So those good bacteria can grow and colonize their stay in the gut. Um, also, the prebiotics can attach to some of the pathogenic organisms and uh, prevent those pathogens from colonizing in the gut. So prebiotics are used quite widely to help improve the microbiome and performance of birds. Of course, probiotics go along with that. These are the good bacteria or the beneficial bacteria. So we can put them in the gut. Again, going back to competitive exclusion, um, they can outcompete with some of the pathogens as well as they produce some bacteriosins to inhibit the growth of pathogens. Postbiotics, um, a little newer technology than prebiotics and probiotics. 
Um, they are derived from microorganisms. Um, by definition, they're inactivated or dead cells, as well as the metabolites that those cells have produced. So basically, postbiotics are end products, end products of um, good bacteria or bacteria, as well as end products of fermentation processes um, that bacteria or yeast were involved in. And to continue on, phytobiotics, um, these are pretty widely used as well. Uh, plant components with bioactive compounds, they can have positive effects on growth and health. Um, some of the categories of phytobiotics are um, herbs, essential oils, uh, botanicals, um, generally used, or at least I guess I think a lot of essential oils being used to help reduce some of the pathogens like Clostridium perfringens and reduce that, um, the problems associated with that. It's just one example. I mentioned bacteriophages, um, just to mention, I don't have any um, data I'll share with that, but Bacteriophages are an even newer technology um, that's starting to, I guess, be seen more. And what they are are specific intracellular parasites of bacteria that can multiply using the metabolic machinery of their host. Um, something that's really important to know about bacteriophages is that they are very, very specific with the pathogens they target. So they may not be as broad spectrum as a prebiotic or probiotic. Um, they are very specific as what they do. And it basically um, those pathogens they do target, um, they, it does that to get rid of them through a process of cellular, cellular lysis. I mentioned enzymes. Um, enzymes are kind of maybe more one of the indirect um, modulators or feed additives that we might use um, to help improve the microbiome. Uh, an example of this would be depending on the grain source we're using. If we're using uh, more wheat or sorghum or barley as compared to corn, which corn being more digestible to poultry, but if we're using one of those other grain sources that's not as digestible um, and not using enzymes, that grain source or the carbohydrates of that grain source are not as digestible. They can stay in the gut and be an excellent source for pathogens that we don't want. But if we use enzymes, we're helping the poultry digest those carbohydrates and hopefully not leaving as much there in the gut for the pathogens to feed on. All right. So now we can get into some of the data over the past year and a half or so. Um, we've been working to collect data related to the microbiome um, and working with one of our partners um, to put this data through an artificial intelligence platform and work on some associations between growth performance and the microbiome and try to tie specific names of bacteria to uh, specific effects as far as being positive and positively associated with growth performance. So. Um, the first trial I'll share is in broilers. We looked at the effect of age. Um, we, we looked at the microbiome at 14, 28, and 42 days of age in these broilers. And we had two different treatments, of course, a control without any feed additive. And then we had a treatment group in which we fed a postbiotic product. So we had a comparison there over age and with and without a postbiotic. We used um, Ross 308 males. Um, reared on used litter. And like I said, we collected uh, our data at three different time points. Um, we collected our data with cloacal swabs, um, six swabs per treatment at each age. And the cloacal swabs were then sent to a lab for DNA sequencing. And those data from the sequencing um, went to the artificial intelligence platform to be analyzed to find out um, what was in the microbiome and, and characterize what's in the microbiome. So um, first I'll show uh, some of the data we receive in the, from the artificial intelligence platform, the Firmicutes to Bacteroides ratio. Um, this is becoming, it's a well-known ratio, but coming more widely seen, I believe, as we go through and learn more about the microbiome and what's going on. Um, the ratio is a good indication of 
eubiosis or dysbiosis, um, as well as an indication of protein to lipid deposition. When we see a greater proportion of firmicutes, the F part, um, we see more lipid deposition. If we have a greater proportion of the bacteroides, we see more protein deposition. So you actually want a smaller ratio. Um, so research is research, right? Not everything reads the book. And that's exactly what we saw when we ran this trial. Um, our ratios came up much, much higher um, compared to what we have seen, at least, and others reported um, in, in our database versus other research. But that's what it is. <laughs> the numbers that we, we got from our microbiome. For some reason, at 14 days, we had really extremely high um, ratios there. They did come down as the birds got older and do see a, a lower ratio there when we fed the postbiotic compared to the control at the 42 days. Um, but we are thinking, and because based on the rest of the microbiome data we have and what I'll show, um, looks like there was a case, some some thing caused some dysbiosis starting before 14 days and definitely from the period of 14 to 28 days. And then we see them, these birds recover or have a better microbiome by 42 days. But um, anyway, interesting when you do something, you think you see, you'll see the progression you want and everything works out, but obviously no disease challenge here. Birds appeared healthy, but something was going on. Uh, another um, factor we look at here is the microbiota richness, which is the number of bacteria genera within the microbiota. Um, we do see we maintained higher numbers in richness when we fed the postbiotic. And then our third factor was diversity, um, how many different genera we found. And of course, the number, well, the numbers were a little higher here in the, um, when we fed the postbiotic there. So when we look at microbiome data, we pictures are great. And these word clouds are a very good tool for us to help visualize what we see in the microbiome, um, what names are there, the abundance of those names. Because um, we're looking at the, the control birds from um, this trial at 14 days on the left, um, or, uh, 28 on the right, and then 42 at the bottom. Well, based on the font size, that gives us an indication of the abundance of the bacteria present. Well, we see lactobacillus in this case as the most abundant in all three groups. Um, so abundance is generally indicated by the size of the font. Um, you can see some differences here as well, um, like if we want to look at 42 days, you see Escherichia. We don't see it not necessarily as big as some of the others, which is not a good thing um, to have that, but it's there. Um, in, so Rombauscha, you see another one that's big here, but maybe not so in the others. So this is just giving us a good, good picture of how many names are there. Obviously, more names there. We have more diverse and then bigger names, more abundance. And of course, we want some of those good names to be bigger. <clears throat> so um, in like I said, in this case, this was our controls. Um, no modulator or feed additive in this group to try and change this. Now we looked at the word clouds of the treatment group that was fed the um, postbiotic again at 14, 28, and 42 days of age. Um, looking at 14 and 28, again, we're seeing lactobacillus as a predominant bacteria, but we actually do see some differences when we get here to 42 days. Um, different bacteria come out. Yes, lactobacillus is still dominant, um, but we, we have some other big ones that come out that are good or good bacteria positively associated with growth. And then we also see more names kind of filled in, if you look at that, um, meaning there's more different genera there, more diverse. And then just a comparison of the word clouds or the microbiota from the control versus the postbiotic at 42 days of age, kind of already picked, pointed some of this out. You see lactobacillus being the predominant in the control. Um, in those fed the post postbiotic, we have this one, allostypes, which I'll talk about again in some other research. 
um, it's correlated to improving feed conversion ratio. So uh, again, that's showing the difference um, by feeding them postbiotic and the postbiotic working to modulate or affect the microbiome to be more favorable. Another way to look at the data we get back on the microbiome is through spider graphs. And what we're doing here is identifying the bacteria, that's what these names are, that are positively and no negatively associated with growth performance, but also those that are most dominant in what we found in our analysis. So in this slide and the others that I have spider graphs, if there's a green ring around the name, it's a good bacteria, positively associated with growth. Um, on my next slide, you'll see some red rings, so those would be negative. And here we see um, the pink and uh, lines and shading is showing us representative of the group fed the postbiotic, whereas the gray is showing us um, the group that was not fed or the control group not fed the postbiotic. In this case, at 14 days, we had the majority or the most abundant bacteria identified um, in this system were positively associated or, or positive biomarkers. But we see by feeding that postbiotic, we had a greater abundance of some of those. Now, when we get to 28 days, we saw a different story. And um, if you remember, I mentioned um, in that table I first showed that our ratios were not what we expected, not what we'd seen before. So that we think there was some indication of some kind of dysbiosis going on. Um, and actually, I didn't say, but we kind of thought maybe that dysbiosis might be due to energy of the diet, although energy, uh, the diet was formulated to meet the energy um, of the specifications for the Ross 308, but um, it could be something in feed management. We really just haven't figured out yet what the cause was, um, but these microbiome data are definitely showing us something happened between 14 to 28 days, because at 14 days, we had a lot of uh, positive biomarkers, and now we get to 28 days, and they're red. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus is definitely not something we want to see regularly. There it is. So uh, while they may not look huge and abundant, they're there, um, more in abundance than um, we, we would like. Now, when we get to 42 days of age, it looks like both groups have kind of recovered um, their microbiota have matured more and become more stable. And what's most prevalent is our good bacteria. Um, again, you know, that, that dysbiosis situation, whatever that was, kind of shows us, shows up in the microbiome data. Now, when we get to 42 days, um, we see both the pink and the gray having a lot of similar positive biomarkers and different abundance. Um, but we just kind of have to keep in mind that this is not the whole story because it does look like, um, the control, obviously, if this is the only picture we look at, it looks like the control has done a good job of increasing the abundance of po positive biomarkers. But if you remember what I said, the, um, group fed, the postbiotic had a more diverse or greater number of different genera present. So here we're just kind of picking out some of the most abundant. Uh, of individual ones, but maybe if we did a total of um, good bacteria, um, total number of good bacteria, um, like I showed you in that table, it would show the postbiotic moving to um, obviously having a good effect and having those shifts to positive biomarkers. So again, different ways we can look at the microbiome data and word clouds versus spider graphs or just in numbers themselves and it, richness and diversity. So I think it's it's everything that needs to be considered, not just one piece of information. Because this, like I said, is not telling us the whole story. It's telling us a good story and that everything seems to have recovered and its microbiome has gone positive. But of course, we don't have hundreds and thousands, what was it, 26,000 different biomarkers identified here. So um, something to think about. All right, so in that study, um, birds were not challenged, um, just fed a postbiotic or not. So now I'm gonna share a little bit of disease challenge work we've done. Um, 
in this, we actually worked with Dr. Kelly Walmsley at Mississippi State with her students. And we were doing a disease, a coccidiosis disease challenge in broilers. We used uh, Ross 708 chicks and um, they were given the coxy challenge, a 10x dose of the coxy vaccine at 14 days of age. And then at 21 days of age or seven days after the challenge is when we collected our cloacal swabs, which of course were sent to the lab for sequencing and then to the artificial intelligence platform for analysis. The treatments we used in this trial were a non-challenged control, um, a challenged control, the challenged group, a challenged group fed a coccidiostat, and then a challenged group fed a the postbiotic product. So again, we'll start with the word clouds. And here it's important again to look at and think about a total picture, just not one picture, just not looking at word clouds or the spider graphs or just the number of general present is kind of looking at the whole picture of everything. Because um, if we were just to consider lactobacillus as a main indicator of a good, good microbiome versus bad, well, everything has lactobacillus as it's most abundant in this case. But if we look at how many genera are present, um, we see there looks like there's fewer here in the unchallenged group versus challenged groups. <laughs> Um, so difference here would be challenge versus unchallenge. Um, but then we can go to look at just the challenged groups, again, lactobacillus, as I've said, but um, it looks like there's a difference just by feeding the coccidiostat in the challenge, the three challenged groups. You see less genera present, um, more space in here, whereas all were given and the coxy challenge, um, but when, when we fed the coccidia stat, we see a difference in the number of genera present. So is, there's not just one factor. I think that goes along with what we've been saying about the whole microbiome, not just one factor affecting everything. There's, there's lots that go into this complex interaction. So in this case, we saw an effect just due to the feed additive that we were using. So we go on to look at the spider graphs. Again, um, in, actually in this case, green is good. Um, those circled in gray are not good. Um, we have the pink represented by the um, treatment birds that were fed the postbiotic product and the blue is representing those that were fed the coccidia stat. So we can see the pink is shaded more towards a lot of the green or the good um, biomarkers, good bacteria and we see some greater abundance. I'll point out this allostypes because I need to, in my mind, um, tie the microbiome information to growth performance. So we can do that here in this research um, because allostypes is known to be um, correlated with improving feed conversion ratio and increasing short chain fatty acid production. Um, so in the, the growth performance data, I can tie that together for us. Um, when we do a COXI challenge, of course, we're gonna do oocyst counts and we're gonna look at the birds fed the coccidia stat versus those the postbiotic. Of course, those fed the coccidia stat are gonna have a reduction in oos oocyst counts. That is the mode of action for the coccidia stat. Now a postbiotic, unfortunately, has the highest <laughs> oocyst counts, but that's not necessarily the mode of action for the postbiotic. The postbiotics mode of action is to shift the microbiome, increase positive biomarkers. And it did just that, like I said, with the allostypes. And what the result is, is a feed conversion ratio similar in the birds fed the coccidia stat and the postbiotic, statistically similar. So while the postbiotics mode of action is not to reduce oocyst count, it does and can shift the microbiome to be more favorable and then result in performance similar to if we fed a coccidia stat. So it all ties together from the microbiome to performance. Another trial in broilers, again, with Dr. Walmsley and her group, um, Ross 708 male chicks used again, same disease challenge mo model with the coxie um, challenge at day 14 of age. 
And seven days later or day 21 is when we collected our cloacal swabs for sequencing and then going through the artificial intelligence platform. In this case, everything was challenged. We had a control, a group fed a coccidiostat, a prebiotic and probiotic treatment. They were used together, a treatment that we just fed a saponin product. And then the last one got the combination of the three, prebiotic, probiotic, as well as the saponin. Looking at the F to B ratio, um, I have circled in red the ratio when we use the three in combination together, the three modulators or feed additives, that's where we obtained our lowest FB ratio, which is good. Um, as far as richness, okay, the total number of um, bacterial genera, we have had a higher number when we use that combination versus the coccidia stack. And again, that just leads to the differences in the mode of action between these types of products versus the coccidia stat. Looking at the spider graphs, um, we have the, all five treatments in this one, although it's kind of hard to see the control shaded in the back there or the coccidia stat group. Um, we kind of see all the others, but so I'm gonna forward to the next slide because I just have those three um, treatments pulled out here, the prebiotic, probiotic, in yellow, which unfortunately had a pretty high abundance of a bad bacteria. The saponin um, had some good and bad. And, but when we used all three together, that was what was the nice story. We increased the abundance of those positive biomarkers by this combination. So that really leads to um, a good thing there when we can figure out um, which of these modulators or feed additives we need to use in which situation and which ones work well together. So in this situation, in this trial with this challenge, it looks like um, we made a good choice there by selecting those three um, feed additives to put together. All right, uh, turkeys. Um, like I said, we know less about the turkey microbiome than we do about the broiler or the chicken. Um, but we hope to and have been working to um, grow our database with turkeys. And in this trial, disease challenge, it was a histomonas challenge. We worked with Dr. Danielle Graham at the University of Arkansas and her students. And our turkey poults um, were fed their treatment diets for 30 days. It was a 30 um, day trial. We gave the histomonas challenge at 10 days of age. And then at day 30 or 20 days after the challenge is when we took our cloacal swabs for microbiome analysis. Our treatments were the non-challenged control, um, a challenged control, and then a challenged group fed that postbiotic product. Starting with the word clouds, um, maybe I should have used these earlier on to make my point, but we definitely can see differences when we look at three, these three word clouds from the unchallenged group on the left, challenged control on the right, and then the challenged with the postbiotic at the bottom. Definitely, it should be very easy to see the different names here. Um, for example, in the challenge group, we see some names here, Clostridium, Escherichia, things we don't necessarily want to see in abundance. Um, we do have some lactobacillus there. Versibacter, which is a good biomarker. Um, you see that much more abundant here in when we use the postbiotic as well as some of the other um, good ones there. So, and oh, up here in unchallenged, we had some streptococcus. So definitely an excellent illustration when we're talking about different ways to look at the microbiome data and easily or more easily try and interpret it. So again, I like to be able to tie performance with the microbiome. And I'm gonna show just two data slides here on body weight and weight gain. Um, these graphs were for the first 10 days prior to the challenge, the histomonas challenge. And we see just by feeding the postbiotic, we had heavier average body weights as well as body weight gain. But for the weight on day 30, as well as the entire weight gain, average body weight gain for the 30 days, um, we did not have a significant effect of the postbiotic, statistically significant. However, we did get that numerical improvement compared to the challenge controls, you know, weights 
and body weight gains that are kind of intermediate there between the challenge control and the non-challenge control. So it looks as though the feeding the postbiotic can help that turkey poult overcome a challenge somewhat um, and, you know, maintain some of the weight gain, you know, some of the average um, daily gains uh, by obviously through the mode of action of that um, postbiotic and shifting the microbiome to be more favorable. So of course, we're going to go to the microbiome and the spider graph. And again, the pink represents a group fed a postbiotic. The black will be the challenged controls and the blue, the um, non-challenged um, control group. And again, we see the pink leaning towards um, the positive biomarkers, the good bacteria in a greater abundance of those. So again, that can help us explain um, how we were able to at least numerically improve weight gain and in, the, um, oops, in those birds that were fed the postbiotic. And this is just some of the characteristics or um, that some of these negative and positive microbiota are associated for, with. So of course we look at these positive ones, intestinal health, um, butyrate production, lean tissue growth. So we're seeing that when we fed that postbiotic in that disease challenge situation, we shifted the microbiome or had a microbiome of those birds different than that of the um, both controls and actually were able to help numerically improve weight, weight gain of those challenged birds fed the postbiotic compared to the challenged controls by the microbiome shifting or having more abundance of certain bacteria. So with all of that, I hope um, you, you have a better understanding of what microbiome and microbiota are, uh, understanding some of the characteristics of the microbiome, um, what it does and some of its functions, how we can affect the microbiome. Hopefully we're doing things in our management and feed formulations and what we're using to help improve that microbiome because there are so many different things that can affect it. And um, obviously I went through a lot of modulators, I called them feed additives that can help work towards having a more favorable microbiome. And then of course, just concluded with some data some ways that we look at the microbiome and tie that microbiome characteristics or data to growth performance. So I guess trying to conclude, um, it's kind of hard to be um, really distinct or, or definite in your conclusions um, because there's so much still unknown. We know or have a lot of knowledge on the poultry microbiome and its microbiota that has greatly increased over the past 10 years. As I said, as we have those more um, new technology to help us analyze and determine what's there uh, as far as the microbiome, because so much of it is just not even culturable in you know, regular lab settings. So um, we've, we've learned a lot in a short amount of time. If you think about the whole big scheme of things, but we still have a lot more to learn. We definitely do not know everything. There's still changes, right? It's variable, <laughs> it changes. So there's plenty of things that we can look at and learn. Um, like that's what I've been saying. A lot of factors affecting the microbiome, biome, a lot of variability in it. So it keeps us all busy, gives us all some challenges and things to think about. Um, I would like to thank those that collaborated with us um, collecting all of these data. Like I said, Dr. Kelly Walmsley at Mississippi State, Danielle Graham, Dr. Danielle Graham at Arkansas. Um, we used APR, Garrett Powell helped us out. And then our partner um, with the artificial intelligence database is Sapiens um, located in Brazil. So obviously all of them have created or contributed greatly and been excellent collaborators as we work to learn about the microbiome and build our database and just provide lots of information and hopefully improve production along the way. Some of my references, and then uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank I'm you, sure. Dr. Laverne. We thank appreciate you. it. Uh -huh. um, so we do have a few questions. Uh, let's get through a couple of them before uh, everybody starts to hop off here. But uh, the okay. first one, 
The first one, I don't know if you can see the uh, Q&A window, but there is a link there to an article. But there was a recently a review by Walker and Hoyles on myths and misconceptions on the human microbiome published in Nature. The authors focused on claims lacking solid evidence, but which are nevertheless often repeated and cited. Are we risking the same in poultry? And if so, how do we avoid it? Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure we always have a risk. Um, I, I, did, I do not know the article and have not seen it, but I will go look it up. Um, you know, we, we always learn and we can, we can do some research and set up our challenges or, and, and get an excellent result. And then we come back the next time and it may not be repeatable. Um, I think that's just what we think about with research. Um, I, I just feel like some of the actual data I've cited here today, you know, we've, we've kind of tied the performance to it. So I think we have some demonstrable things that are kind of concrete there. <laughs> um, but that's a chance we take in research. But that's why we do research. That's why we learn um, to take those chances. And hopefully in the end, we've done something um, to improve, you know, our industries and the, what our performance of the products we're producing. That sounds good. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, I mean, we've got a long ways to go in terms of research and a lot more things we can possibly learn from future work. Mm -hmm. So our next question for the litter, for the role of litter on bird micro microbiome, do chickens such as broilers have a more diverse microbiome as since basically during commercial operations, their litter is not replaced as often as turkeys. I'm, Sorry, I did not get that whole question. It's okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase. So okay. in terms of uh, bird microbiome, mm -hmm. do chickens, broilers, tend to have a more diverse microbiome because we don't clean out and replace that litter as often as they do in turkeys? Um, so I guess I can kind of say, well, we probably don't know because we don't know everything. <laughs> um, I guess in my thinking, though, um, it's very possible that the broiler could have a more diverse microbiome because of what's in that litter, but it's also what's in that litter can be affected by the litter treatments, the, you know, whatever management process they use for the litter as well. Now, just because you clean out, um, does not mean you'll get this like in turkeys or, or even in broilers. If you go in with fresh bedding, you're not going to get the same microbiome in each farm just because you cleaned out, right? You have different sources of bedding um, that come from different locations. Um, <laughs> so it probably sounds like I'm kind of avoiding an answer, but um, we just don't know everything. It, it is very possible that, um, and I guess I would tend to think, yes, your microbiomes are going to be very different um, and maybe more robust or better by reusing that litter as long as your reused litter is, is good. Okay. as far as microbiome makeup. Was the uh, first data that you showed in your presentation, was that, um, this is this is the wording in the question, is that shotgun data or 16S? 16S. Okay. That, that's, that's what our sequencing has been, yeah, 16S. Okay. Um, traditionally, what, what traditionally has been about the good microbes make them good? Is it the metabolites or byproducts they make, nutrients they digest, et cetera? Yes. Um, so definitely it's going to um, be what they produce is definitely going to be good. Um, characterize them as good, of course. And um, it, yeah, there's, again, a lot to learn, a lot to know, a uh, lot to figure out, but I mean, generally we can kind of, you know, literature searches are out there um, or, or done to look for all these different bacteria and what we know about them. So um, you kind of maybe doing some extrapolation between what you find in the literature and what you see actually happen in the bird 
Um, that's one of the reasons we're, we're working on in this area and trying to tie things together with performance versus the good bacteria that we do detect, kind of confirming um, that what's reported about the characteristics or what that bacteria produces really do um, really does happen in the bird in production. Kind of a second part to that question, uh, we take all of those those things that were mentioned, the metabolites, the byproducts, the nutrients that they consume, et cetera, all of that together. Is there a holistic approach for looking at the microbiota and their metabolites? Um, there probably will be and should be at some point. Um, we've even had these internal discussions that we're looking at everything, which I guess kind of would be considered holistic, but we need to narrow our focus and determine exactly which good and which ba bad bacteria we need to focus in on. Um, because of course there is, is, there's so much out there, you know, we 26,000 different genera are detected in some of our, you know, in, in one set of data. Well, do we really need to know all 26,000 or, you know, we really need to focus in on um, the most common good and bad bacteria or biomarkers and, and do that. So I think if we can narrow it down, um, that could become our whole holistic approach there. Um, but you know, now it's kind of all over, I believe, you know, we're just looking for everything, trying to build a database and determine what we need to be looking for. And when, okay. at what age? Okay. Or state of production or disease challenge. Or, right. We still have a few questions coming in, but we've got three more on the screen right now. The next okay. one is, um, this is from um, one, of, one of our attendees here. I find it surprising that Bacillus cereus is considered a good bacteria as it is known, as it is a known toxin producing bacteria. Was metagenomic sequencing performed to show that this strain was non-pathogenic? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think the metagenomic sequencing was done there. Um, you know, so we can find good and bad characteristics of these different bacteria, a, a single, obviously, as the, the questions being asked, um, there are strains that can be good or bad, um, it's very similar. Um, so that's just kind of something that I guess we'll work on in our database building and our knowledge of this uh, whole microbiome and the microbiota within it. Um, so I guess I don't have, no, I, I guess the answer to the sequencing would probably be no. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So um, for intentionally shifting the microbiome to a more favorable condition, do you think supplementing with a pre, a pro, a or a post uh, post biotic is more effective, or would it be a combo? Yes. Well, <laughs> um, again, not a definite answer, right? They each have their their place in regulating or modulating the microbiome. Um, as far as the exact combination, uh, I did show an example where we used a prebiotic, probiotic, as well as a saponin. Um, I have another, just as an example, I did not show uh, another combination, um, which was actually the postbiotic, but it didn't, necess didn't necessarily do any better than other combinations. So, you know, it's going to be hard to exactly answer a def definitely that way, because it's going to depend on situation, um, the microbiome of the environment. Um, the age of the birds. I think there's a place for all of them, definitely. Um, and we we may be able to use, actually that combination I used worked in this situation. I don't know, if, you know, maybe we try and repeat it, maybe it'll do again, it may not work in another. So I, I believe it's just, you know, knowing, um, having the nutritionist and the vets really knowing what's going on um, within complexes and, you know, trying things to see what's working and what's not, because they'll find even within a company, a certain combination is not going to work in two different complexes. Unfortunately, it's a lot of unknown here. And I think that's what my answers are showing. Right. <laughs> I feel like I know something and I think we are learning, but 
there's too there's so many variables. Um, again, that word variable comes up when we talk about microbiome and and how new this science really still is. So here, uh, this next question is: Have you explored the units of activity role of bacterial additives under these same type of experiments? Not specifically, no. We have just just starting um, in this area, so kind of more just feeding them as a, you know, described in these trials um, and collecting the growth performance and the microbiome data. We have not um, kind of taken anything out different, separate. It's just been all um, like, like I presented at this point. So I'll, uh, that was actually our, our last question there, but I'm going to finish it up with one of my own. So kind of looking into the future, what would, uh, you know, if, 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 we could pick which experiments and you know that had that we could do that would have the most impact in providing some of this unknown knowledge. What kind of experiments or studies would you like to see? Or if you you had no no funding restrictions, had plenty of time to you know space and birds and uh, resources to do this, what would we do? What would be the most impactful studies that would help out with this situation? So I think the most impactful are still going to have a disease challenge, which is typical in the industry, um, trying to mimic the what's going on and being able to look at the different combinations of additives, um, you know, single together, just multiples, as well as different inclusion rates. Um, you know, you can go on forever. But then at the same time, we really have to get these into actual production and evaluate them there as well um, and see what's really happening once we get out into the field with these and these different combinations and, you know, it being so variable and so diverse, you know, you, you kind of got to look at geographical locations or complexes and just um, lots of situations to try these. And as far as disease challenges, unfortunately, they're out there. Um, so we kind of have to make educated um, decisions on what to use and when and, you know, kind of apply that. So um, I think it's as far as research kind of continue where we've been going and just, you know, more combinations, less combinations, <laughs> um, as well as, you know, inclusion rates to kind of hone in on what might be most effective based on the level of challenge. Dr. Laverne, we thank you for your time this afternoon. I think everybody's uh, learned a lot. It was a nice uh, update and uh, interesting uh, look into where we are currently with this uh, type of research in this area. Obviously, it's an area of interest, uh, high interest, it seems like, across both industry and academia and mm -hmm. researchers, uh, researchers in, uh, in industry as well. So I, I thank everyone, uh, the audience that has joined us this afternoon. Thank you for hanging in there. And I hope you found this uh, webinar informative and useful. Thank you, Dr. Fairchild. Thank you to everybody for attending as well.